Good morning. Hi, Cindy Denning, nice to see you. I'm gonna give it a few minutes since we just started so you all have a chance to pop in. Sandy Wilson. Some of you I've had the opportunity of meeting. Some of you I've seen your names each week, which is really cool. And let's just give it another minute or so. And then we'll get started. Thank goodness for editing tools, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I will start um, because I'll do my intro and then by the time you our speaker starts, um, we may have a few more joining us. So welcome everybody to the first annual conference. It's time making end of life part of life. So glad you could join us. Um, as I've said in previous webinars on this, we're able to do this through the support of our members. Um, Sutter Care at Home Roseville, Sutter Care at Home Sacramento and UC Davis Hospice. It's through their support and their belief and their commitment in getting out information and education on hospice, on topics like we've been bringing you and um, volunteer training, which is kind of on hold for a lot of us right now. But thank you so much to them that we're able to do this. So today is part three of our four part series and it's having brave conversations at the end of life. So before I introduce our speaker, I usually always tell a story and so I'll do it again. Um, I currently have a girlfriend and I may have mentioned her last week, but I have a girlfriend who was diagnosed with um, stage four pancreatic cancer. And because we've been friends, she's listened to me on my journey through hospice and volunteering. And she knows I'm very passionate about having these conversations, which has been really nice for her because now she's at a point where she has to use it. And because we've just had casual conversations about my passion, it's really made it a lot easier for her to talk to her family, her grandchildren. Um, and then even her and I, I'll tell you, my first go-to when she starts talking about something they say oh no 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 you're going to be fine yes you're going to be fine and i have to take a breath and realize i have to be strong and i have to be there in that conversation when she talks about you know what's going to happen to me at the end of life or i i feel bad leaving my grandkids before they get graduate from college or i'm going to miss my children or i'm going to miss you and and how are you going to do without me and, you know, like I said, the first go-to is always kind of, mm, I don't want to talk about this. It's really hard. Um, but because of some of the training I've done and being involved with the Sacramento Hospice Consortium and meeting so many wonderful people and our speaker today, I'm able to practice being there present. I honestly didn't think I'd have to use some of this stuff so soon. And so um, our speaker's presentation today is really vital for me as well. The other thing, the reason I wanted to share that is many of you I know are also volunteers and we volunteers are kind of on hold right now. But one thing that we can do to help in between is learning to talk honestly and openly and compassionately about this with our friends, with our family members, with you know who we come in our circles of influence, right? Um, that's a really good thing for a volunteer to do as well. We just I feel we just need to make this a little easier for us to all talk about it because it's going to happen. It's going to happen for everybody. We just don't know when some know sooner. Um, and so anyways, that's kind of my thought on it. And um, I hope as a volunteer, you consider doing that. So I will quit rambling and I will introduce our next presenter to you. Reverend Christine Hader Winnett serves as a palliative care and inpatient hospice chaplain at UC Davis Medical Center. She holds a Master of Divinity from Pacific School of Religion, a BA in Peace and Global Studies from Earlham College, and a Certificate in Women's Studies and Religion from the Graduate Theological Union. Prior to serving as a chaplain, Christine worked for a decade in communications for faith-based nonprofits. She is a commissioned minister in the Federation of Christian Ministries. Christine lives in Davis with her husband, young child, and two cats. 
Thank you, Christine, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all right now. So, Brenda, what's the best way for me to here? Let me, Brenda, it looks like I need permission to do screen share. Okay. Technology. Let's see. All right. Now try. All right. Here we are. Thank you. So can everyone see my slides? I can, this is Brenda. <laughs> Sounds good, Sounds good. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Brenda said, I'm palliative care and inpatient hospice chaplain serving UC Davis Medical Center. In my work, I spend a lot of time sitting with patients as they discern what sort of care they want in the end of life and helping them have those conversations with their families. I'm also able to see a lot of the end results of those conversations. See what happens when families have those conversations well and when they don't, or when they're not able to have them at all. So today I wanna to talk a little bit with you about why it's important to have conversations about the end of life with your loved ones and offer a few tips on how to start and guide those conversations. I'll also end by talking about a few spiritual methods of discernment that might help you have these sacred conversations because I do think that they are sacred. Um, and these are tips that I hope will be beneficial whether or not you come from a particular faith tradition. But first, I wanted to start us out with a poem. This is Ask Me by William Stafford. Sometimes when the river is ice, ask me mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in their slow way into my thought and some have tried to help or to hurt. Ask me what difference their strongest love or hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden. And there are comings and goings from miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the river says, that is what I say. I wanted to start with this poem because I think that it really beautifully captures how much goes into making a human life. So much more than can ever fully be appreciated by another person even those people that know us and love us best. And in the same way that each person's life is unique and mysterious, so is each person's definition of a good death. So by asking our loved ones about their wishes, rather than just assuming that they know, we know what they want or that they'd want the same thing that we'd want, we're really giving them a beautiful gift of honoring their uniqueness and allowing them to speak for themselves. But even if we know that these conversations are important ones to have, they can still, still feel awkward and scary. It can be hard to discuss end of life issues with our loved ones or even think about it ourselves. Why would we want to have such hard conversations? Isn't it better to just take life one day at a time? Can't we assume the people that love us best will know what we want? 
To answer that question, I wanted to offer a few case studies from my own experience as a chaplain in a hospital setting. These stories are all based on real situations, though the identifying information has been changed. And obviously the pictures I'm using are stock photos and not actual photos of patients. Brief content warning. These case studies deal with people dying difficult deaths in a hospital setting. So if that's upsetting or triggering for you at all, please feel free to grab a coffee for yourself in the next 10 minutes or so and then come back to us. The first person I want to talk to you about is Susan. Susan was an 85 year old woman who came into the hospital after suffering a fall. She was intubated and received aggressive treatment in the ICU, but was never able to regain consciousness. While there, she also developed pneumonia, making her condition even more critical. Doctors eventually told her family that it was unlikely she would recover from the pneumonia. And if she did, it was unlikely her brain would ever be able to recover in any meaningful way from the fall. Susan had two sons. The older son, John, had been living with Susan prior to her fall and wanted everything possible done to save his mother. He knew that she'd had an excellent quality of life prior to the fall, and he was confident that God would restore her back to her previous state. I think it's also possible that he suffered from some guilt about her fall, even though he'd been taking really excellent care of her and couldn't have been blamed for what happened. Every time I'd talk to him, he'd show me pictures that Susan's great grandchildren had drawn for her and tell me with confidence that he was sure God was going to grant her more time with them. Susan's younger son, Matt, lived out of state and he hadn't been around for much of his mom's last few decades. He felt some guilt about not being more present and also sensed some resentment from his brother that he hadn't been a more active caretaker. Matt was also a retired RN, so he was able to see pretty immediately that there was no way his mother was going to survive her multiple health challenges and refer, return to a life as meaningful as the one that she'd had before. He worried that her treatments were causing her to suffer unnecessarily. He told his brother this, but John refused to give up hope for full recovery. Finally, while Matt was visiting his mother, she went into cardiac arrest and a code blue was called. As she was receiving chest compressions, Matt finally told the doctors to stop trying to resuscitate her and allow her to pass peacefully. John had been at home resting when that happened and was not able to be with his mom when she died. Even worse, he blamed Matt for allowing her to die when he believed that continued CPR might have given her another chance. There are so many tragedies in this story. The first one obviously is for Susan who received treatment toward the end of life that she might not have wanted and that may have just been adding to suffering. But I also worry about the tragedy in Matt and John's relationship. Siblings should be able to support each other in their grief. But I'm worried that the arguments they had about Susan's end of life wishes may have caused a permanent rift in their relationship. I never got to know Susan while she was awake but I doubt that that's the kind of legacy she wanted to leave her family. Then there's Martha. Martha was a 65 year old woman who suffered from a sudden stroke at home. 
By the time she got to the hospital, her prognosis looked very poor. Her husband of over 40 years, Jim, was of course heartbroken and terrified at the thought of losing the love of his life. In the weeks after her stroke, Jim told Martha's doctors that he wanted everything possible done to keep her alive. In the coming days, as shock began to wear off, Jim became more and more concerned that Martha wouldn't have wanted such extreme treatment. He told me that he vaguely remembered Martha having an advanced directive done years ago during a pre previous hospitalization but he didn't know where it was. He called their lawyer who had no record of her having one. Well, I said, if she made an advanced directive, she must have thought about what she wanted in this sort of situation. Did she ever tell you what those thoughts were? No, he said. She tried, but I didn't wanna hear it. It was just too scary to think about. Meanwhile, while Jim was distressed about the aggressive treatment that Martha was receiving, he also couldn't imagine living with the decision to remove life support, especially if there was a document out there somewhere that might have said that she wanted to continue to receive treatment. He felt stuck. Finally, we encouraged him to call the hospital that Martha had been at before to see if they kept a copy of her advanced directive that he would thought she'd written. Luckily, they still had it on file and were able to fax it to us. In Martha's advanced directive, she made it clear that she didn't want to be intubated or have any other aggressive ICU treatments. Knowing that, Jim was finally able to allow Martha to die comfortably but he expressed guilt about knowing that he'd allowed her to have so much more aggressive treatments than she'd wanted. Martha's wishes weren't followed because she hadn't talked with her husband about what those wishes were or told him where to find her advanced directive. And finally, I wanna to talk to you about Lewis. Lewis was a 70 year old who suffered a heart attack. He was intubated, received CPR, and was able to be revived. After about a week, he regained consciousness and made what was really an impressive recovery. I was asked to participate in a meeting with Lewis, his doctor, his palliative care nurse, and his wife. In the meeting, Lewis laid in bed, holding his wife's hand and beaming with joy. The meeting started out with his doctor congratulating him on his recovery and telling him that it really was exceptional. I know, said Lewis, I've got my miracle. His wife smiled. Then came the harder part of the conversation. The doctor said, with your heart in its condition, I'm worried it's likely you'll suffer another heart attack maybe soon. So I wanna make sure that we know how to treat you if that happens. If your heart stopped again, would you want CPR? His wife jumped up immediately. Of course he would. We would have lost him if you hadn't done CPR before. And now look at him, he looks as good as new. Lewis interrupted her. No. He said, I don't think I'd want that again. Lewis told us that he was so grateful for his miracle, including the CPR that he received earlier in the hospitalization. And even though he didn't remember most of his time in the ICU, he could tell that it had been hard on his body. He sensed that a second round in the ICU might not have the same positive outcome. And he was certain that he'd rather die at home than in a hospital. So Lewis completed an advanced directive that outlined those wishes. 
He also had his doctor complete a post form for him, which is a doctor's order that states that a patient should not be resuscitated. Lewis then got to go home with his wife to enjoy the extra time given to him by his miracle without worrying that he'd have to suffer another lengthy hospitalization. As these stories show, we don't know what our loved one's wishes are for their end of life until we ask them. And we can't assume that they'd know what our wishes are unless we tell them what they are. I have one more personal example for you. I recently had a discussion about end of life wishes with my own mother for the first time. And I was so surprised by what she told me and what sort of values went into those discussions for her. This is a woman that I have known my whole life and that I think I have a very open relationship with. We've both spent our careers working in hospital settings and I was certain that this shared experience would give us the same perspective about end of life treatment. But as we talked, she shared values and beliefs that she'd acquired from her years working in a hospital and her experience watching her own parents die that I had no idea about. I heard stories that I'd never heard before, but that were an important part of her, important part of how she'd want to be treated if she were end of life. I would have had no idea what she wanted if I hadn't asked. My mother is a great example of how unique each person's definition of a good death is. For some, to die well means dying at home, surrounded by family. Others don't mind dying in the hospital and would want to know that doctors did everything they possibly could to save them. Some people have religious or cultural ideas around what a good death is and what sort of medical treatment would be or would not be desired. Here are just a few of the things that influence people's end of life wishes. Religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, beliefs that we hold about the medical system, how we've seen loved ones die, well or poorly. Our own past experiences with the medical system, times that we've been ill, how we've been treated by doctors and hospital staff. Our own limits of pain. What we feel may be undone in life. What makes us feel dignified and respected. The desire to be surrounded by loved ones or to be left alone the desire to be home or in a meaningful location or not. And I think that when you look at all of these things, that's why these conversations about end of life are so deeply sacred. Even if they're hard and awkward, they give us an opportunity to really get to know our loved one's hopes and values and everything that makes them up on such a deeper level. And it can really help us share more fully with each other. So with all that in mind, here are a few tips on how to start these sacred conversations. Find the right moment. Honestly, for many of us, I think that's the hardest part it can feel really awkward to bring up the topic of end of life wishes. I've heard so many times from family members of my patients that they'd always meant to ask their parent or spouse or sibling about what they'd want, but they just never found the right moment. And then unfortunately, it becomes too late 
in many cases to have those conversations. When looking for the right moment, it obviously helps to find a time when there aren't too many people around. And when you think your loved one would feel comfortable sharing some of their deepest and most private thoughts. It's also best to choose a moment when emotions aren't already high. In my work, I often see people first have this conversation after being hospitalized. And while that's sometimes just the way the timing has to happen, it's really not an ideal moment for that conversation in a lot of ways. People are already so scared and vulnerable when they're in the hospital that it can be tar hard to talk about these issues in that moment without it adding to stress or maybe seeming like a bad omen. If possible, it really is better to have these conversations before you get to the point of being hospitalized at a time when you feel calm and peaceful. Obviously, it is easier if these topics come up naturally. But there are a few ways that you can sort of help those natural conversations come along. Some potential conversation openings could be the death of a celebrity or another well publicized death can be a really helpful way to bring up this topic. I think that Alex Trebek, who was so open about his struggle with cancer, is one person who's giving a lot of people the opportunity to have these conversations with their loved ones now. Public deaths like his can be a good moment to reflect with family on the way a celebrity died. You can ask, is that what you'd want for yourself? What do you think worked well for this person? Is there anything that you wish could have been different for them? Likewise, the death of a family member or friend can also be an opportunity to reflect on what sort of care you'd want or wouldn't want for yourself. So of course, depending on how distraught you or your family is about this person's death, this may or may not be a good option for you. It might be easier to bring this topic up in response to an acquaintance's death than a close friend or relative. Because like I said earlier, you really want a time when emotions aren't already high. In response to a movie or TV show you watch together. This can be a documentary or an informational series on end of life issues, but it can also be a work of fiction. You can use the dying process of a character on TV or a movie as a starting point to discuss your own hopes for death and dying. And many of us have cultural or religious celebrations that naturally engage in conversations around death. For those of us who recently finished celebrating Dia de los Muertos or Samhain or All Souls Day, these holidays can often be culturally appropriate and meaningful times to have these conversations. And it's particularly helpful that many times these are also times when families are naturally gathered together, maybe not this year, but normally, and you can have the conversation face to face. You can also start the conversation by sharing about your own wishes first. A lot of times family members can feel understandably on guard and ambushed by someone suddenly asking them about their end of life wishes. Particularly if you're trying to have this conversation with someone who's older than you or in more frail health, they might get defensive if you suddenly start asking about their end of life plans. By sharing your own wishes first, it becomes less of an interrogation and more of a shared conversation. And finally, if you are still struggling with finding a graceful way to bring this up with your family members, please feel free to use me as an excuse. When talking over dinner tonight, you can say, for the last few weeks, I've been attending this really great virtual conference on making the end of life part of life. 
And today's topic was about the importance of having end of life discussions with your loved ones. It made me realize that I'd never shared my wishes with you and I don't know what yours are. Would you be willing to talk to me about that? Either now or we could schedule a time for later. Once you've started the conversation, I think it's important to also be sure to create an environment that's safe, supportive, and that can allow for deep listening and sharing. One important way to do that is by normalizing the conversation. As I said earlier, it's natural for people to feel defensive or uncomfortable when someone asks them about their end of life wishes. And it can help to remind your loved one and yourself that these are conversations that everyone should be having. Having this conversation does not mean that you're at the end of your life right now. And in fact, it's wise to have the conversations while you're in good health and are not feeling rushed or afraid. Do your best to frame the conversation as responsible and loving rather than morbid and scary. I think it's also important to center this conversation on love and to vocalize that truth as much as possible. It's important for a loved one to hear that you're not bringing this up because you want to distress them or burden them with uncomfortable decisions. You're opening the conversation because you love them and you want to be sure that you'll always be able to care for them in the way that they need. Or maybe you want to be sure that if something happens to you, they won't feel the burden of having to make all these decisions on their own. Also, be honest about your own discomfort and about how hard these conversations can be. If you feel shy, awkward, or even scared about having to talk about the subjects, I think it's better to just admit that. By being vulnerable enough to express your own anxieties or concerns, you also give your family member the permission to do the same thing, which can lead to deeper sharing. Finally, empower your loved one to make their own decisions. Affirm for them that they know their body, their values, and their hopes better than anybody. Make sure that they know that your role is to support them in that decision making not to push a decision on them. My next tip is start big, go small. When I have these conversations with my own family members or with patients, I often try to start out with more of a broad and open discussion. And that's what I call starting big. I'll ask people if they have any particular hopes for how they'd want to die, or if they have ways that they know they definitely wouldn't want to die. I'll ask if they've learned anything from previous illnesses or from the death of loved ones about what kind of care they want. Have they ever visited anyone in the ICU? Have they ever known anyone that's been on home hospice? or who's died in the hospital? How did they feel about those experiences? I also always ask what makes life meaningful for them. Is it time with family or eating good food or having a feeling of independence? How would they feel if those things were taken away or limited? These broader conversations can help open up the conversation and give people freedom to think more creatively about what really matters to them 
rather than forcing them to choose between limited options. As the conversation goes on, it'll become time to move on to a more specific question. And that's what I call going small. Some examples of smaller, more specific questions might include, have they thought about CPR or intubation? Have they thought about feeding tubes? Do they have a sense of what those things entail? It might also be a little bit of research and learning on your part and their part about what some of these things are. It's also really important to ask who they want to have be the decision maker for them if they can't make decisions themselves. A lot of people say that they want their family to decide as a unit, which is a really admirable goal. That's also what I want. But as Susan's case study earlier showed, that's just not always possible. Sometimes two people that really love someone can just not agree on what care that person would want. And that becomes even more true when it's five or nine people. So it's good to come up with one person that you'd want to have be the tiebreaker if your family just was not able to agree. I mentioned advanced directives a little earlier in the case study. Um, I wanted to touch on that a little bit today. An advanced directive is a really important way to legally outline who you'd want to have be your medical decision maker if you couldn't make decisions for yourself. It also gives the writer an opportunity to write down some of the things they definitely would or would not want in terms of medical care. For instance, you can say, whether you'd be open to a feeding tube, or if you'd rather die at home than in the hospital, if that's possible. If you're not already familiar with advanced directives, you can download them for free online. On the screen is an address for one website that has them. You don't need a lawyer involved in drafting it unless you want one involved. In order to make them legally valid, you just need either a notary or two witnesses. And it's written very simply. So even if you don't have a whole lot of medical knowledge, it should be pretty easy to go through. In addition to being an important legal document, this document can also be help, a helpful way to frame the conversation. Especially if you don't have much knowledge of healthcare, the questions can be helpful in guiding the discussion and making sure that you've touched on all the important questions. I also want to give a shout out to Five Wishes, which is a more in-depth and perhaps value-based way of having that conversation with family. Like a regular advanced directive, you can print out a Five Wishes document and complete it on your own. And it's considered a legally binding document outlining your wishes in most states, including California. But rather than only focusing on what medical treatments you would or wouldn't want, the five wishes document also allows you to go into much more detail about what sort of care you'd find comforting, what sort of environment you'd want to be in, and how you'd want your loved ones to engage with you during end of life. It is a very gentle and thoughtful document. And regardless of if it's what you choose to use for your advanced directive, it can really help frame and guide the conversation with a loved one in a caring way. And that's the website there on the screen for it if you want more information or want a copy for yourself to use. One of the good things about having these discussions early is you really have time to let your family discern these questions more slowly instead of feeling rushed to make final decisions right away. So don't feel the need to get the whole conversation out in one sitting. 
it can sometimes help to introduce a topic, have a little bit of conversation, and then schedule time to follow up with each other's thoughts later. The questions involved in planning for end of life are really big ones, and it's okay if you or your loved one don't have all the answers right now. You might want to say something like, it's okay if you don't know the answer to that now. That's why we're doing this in advance. Can we agree to take three or four days to think it over and then come back and look at an advance directive together? And with doing that, I know it seems kind of formal, but I really do recommend getting out your calendars and scheduling a time too, um, so that you give yourselves that time to think, but you have that commitment to actually come back to it as opposed to saying that you'll follow up and then life gets in the way. Finally, understand that you might have to do this again. The first time I completed an advanced directive, I was in my residency for chaplaincy. I was married, but I wasn't a mother yet. And I also didn't know quite as much about my own health as I do now. I wrote my document with the understanding that I had at the time, based on my experience in a hospital setting, which at that point was a new experience, and some experience I'd had with loved ones' deaths. This year, about five years after that last advanced directive, I wrote up a new one that better reflects my current hopes for care and the priorities that I have right now which are really different from what they were only five years ago. So while it can be easy to sort of breathe a sigh of relief after an advanced directive is completed and to just put it in a drawer somewhere and try to forget about it, I think that it's better to keep the conversation open with our loved ones and make sure that they know that they're always welcome to talk to us if their wishes change. It's always okay to ask a family member, hey, in some recent conversations, I've realized you're talking about your hopes for end of life differently than you used to. Do you wanna look over and update your advanced directive? Now, since I'm a chaplain and my work is primarily focused on helping engage with these questions from a spiritual perspective, I wanted to leave you with just a few discernment techniques that are spiritually grounded, but I think that can be helpful to people of all or no faith. One technique that's been very helpful for myself in this work is the Quaker understanding of clearness committee. For those of you who aren't familiar with Quakers or the religious society of friends, they traditionally don't have priests or ministers that can provide easy answers on what the correct thing to do is in spiritual matters. They rely deeply on each person's individual relationship with the divine and how that person feels that God or their own inner wisdom is speaking to them in that moment. Quakers also rely deeply on their community to help them discern what God is really pointing them towards and how they're being called to live in a particular situation. Whenever a Quaker has to make an important decision, whether to retire, whether to get married, or potentially how to pursue a course of medical treatment, it can be common for them to hold a clearness committee as a way to discern what the next step should be. This committee isn't made up of experts. They aren't ministers or doctors or relevant professionals in some field. They're just people who are invested in the person's life and who are willing to discern with that person where God could be calling them or where their own inner wisdom is calling them. The meeting is mainly conducted in prayerful silence and the main rule is that members can only ask the person who requested the meeting honest and open questions. 
So they can't give advice about what the person should do. They can't challenge or respond back to a statement. And they can't ask leading questions. The point of the clearness committee is not to tell someone what they should do. It's to provide sacred space for that person to discern for themselves the way forward. I've seen this technique be a wonderful way to accompany people who are making difficult decisions in a way that honors their own internal wisdom. If you're interested in learning more about clearness committees, Quaker writer Parker Palmer has written a lot about how they can be useful for non-Quakers who are facing difficult decisions. And his book, A Hidden Wholeness, which I wrote on the screen there, is a particularly helpful resource on this topic. Another method that I found helpful is from the Ignatian spiritual exercises, which were developed by St. Ignatius of Loyola, who some of you might know as the founder of the Jesuits in the Catholic tradition. In Ignatian spiritual exercises, there's a tradition of what they call discerning spirits. And one really important way to discern spirits is by following your emotions to see what they might be trying to tell you. According to St. Ignatius, the right decision will leave you with a feeling of peace and well-being, even if it was a really sad and hard decision to make. And that's a thing that I've been blessed to see a lot of patients and their family members experience sometimes is coming to a really painful decision. But then they'll tell me, you know, I feel so much more at peace than I have for days or maybe weeks now that it's been made. And that can really be a sign that whatever it is was the right decision. Meanwhile, if after making a decision, you continue to have lingering doubts or fears or frustrations, that can be a sign that maybe the decision needs some rethinking. And this is, I think, yet another way and yet another reason that it's important to take a few days to reflect when you're discerning end of life wishes, either your own or helping a family member discern, um, because it takes some time to discern your spirits and to see how a decision kind of landed for you emotionally. One way that I discern spirits when I'm making a decision is by trying on that decision for a few days. For example, if I'm struggling to decide between multiple choices, I might choose one of the options to just try on for a few days to see how it fits. After I've made that choice, I'll go about my day acting as if the decision has been finalized. I sometimes ask my husband or a friend to join me in pretending that I've committed myself to that decision for a day or so. The next day, I'll revisit the decision and I'll try to reflect on how it felt to have decided that course of action. Did I feel at peace, hopeful, and relaxed, knowing that the decision had finally been made? Or did I feel anxious and full of regret? If so, that's a sign that the decision that I tried on might not be the right choice for me. So the next day I might try on a different option to see how that choice feels. Well, we're coming to the end of the formal part of my talk. I think we'll have some time for questions, but before we open up to those, I just wanted to close this out with one last poem, this time by the great Mary Oliver. When death comes. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn. When death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measle pox 
when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades. I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, toward silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. That was wonderful. So what I did mention at the beginning, can you hear me by the way? The computer's acting weird. I can now. I didn't hear the first part of that. Okay. Um, what I didn't mention at the beginning, everyone, is we do have a Q&A box at the bottom that you could have typed into should you chose to, but we have some time now, and we have Christine here with us. Do you have any questions about our presentation? Do you have any comments you'd like to make, or even a question in your life that she may be able to offer a little um, assistance with, since we have her here? Um, if you're interested in doing that, you can either type it into the chat or there is a, um, the very bottom, you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. I'll move you to the top. So we're gonna open it up for some questions if anybody has some. Kind of quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to assume I'm looking through here real quick. So here's what we can do. If you think of your question afterwards um, that you'd like me to, I can forward it to Christine and I'm sure Christine will um, be happy to give us some information back, right? I would be happy to, yes. Okay, so thank you for your time today. It's been really good. and helpful and opportune. I mean, it's just, it's the right time right now. It is. It is. I think it's a time a lot of people are having these conversations and it's an important time too. Hey, we have a question, Christine. Hey. So what influences do you find are opening up this conversation more for the people you meet? Mm. Um, sometimes it's a lot of necessity an understanding that um, that their health is failing. Uh, I do most of my work in the hospital setting. And so a lot of times a particular health crisis might have brought them in. Um, as Brenda said, for a lot of people, I think the pandemic is a thing that's making people think about these issues more. Um, I will be honest and say, like I mentioned to you, I updated my own advanced directive this year and that was a large part of what inspired it for me. Um, but I think that, and there's a lot that's really scary about this time and a lot that's really scary about 
having to think about those things in this context. And also, I think maybe that's a little bit of a silver lining for this pandemic is that maybe our culture is becoming a little bit more comfortable talking about these things, um, which I think was happening before the pandemic. But I think it is maybe opening some people up. Um, a lot of times seeing a loved one get ill can be a thing that influences them wanting to talk about this issue. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I think in terms of starting the conversation, asking people what they find meaningful can be a kind of safe way to start the conversation too. Um, that's maybe not as intense of a place to start. And I think we all instinctively are passionate about wanting to talk about where we find meaning. So it can be a safe place to start that conversation for a lot of us. Thanks for the question, Ellie. Um, mm -hmm. Margo has a question. For a volunteer, what is the best way to approach an, approach an issue like the one with the two brothers? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think a lot of times, I will say for me, there's always this instinct to want to jump in and fix it. Um, which depending on your relationship with them and your role as a volunteer, I mean, just might not be yours to do. And I think that a thing about this work that we all learn is that there are a whole lot of things that need fixing and most of it's beyond our control. Um, so I think sometimes there's a need of to just kind of give it over, um, however we can do that spiritually or emotionally. Um, with the brothers, I think a lot of times the best thing you can do is really show each of them love and concern um, and an understanding that each of them in their own way are trying to do what's best for their mother. Um, I feel like a lot of times in these situations, one of the brothers might be end up being kind of vilified, um, particularly sometimes by other healthcare workers of like, oh, he's not being realistic, or he's really hard to deal with. And I think the more that we treat people like that, kind of the more it becomes true, you know. Um, so I think a really lovely thing that volunteers can do is just show love to everyone involved and make sure that they all know that regardless of what they decide, um, we're on their side. And we're on their side because we care about them, because we know that they care about their family member, um, because we want what's best for them. Um, and just being that caring, supportive presence can be really helpful. I've talked to family members who've told me, you know, my family, my patient, my loved one came into the hospital and nurses and doctors and chaplains and volunteers were so loving and supportive. And then once I started making decisions they didn't agree with, like I felt that love pull away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that can make an already hard situation a lot harder. So just being consistent with that care is really important. Thanks, thanks Margo too. And then Sandy Wilson put, you know, and I should change where I'm sitting and I'm right in the sun all of a sudden. From finalexitnetwork.org, my choices if I become sick in the COVID pandemic. Oh, I don't know that resource. I'm going to look it up after this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, thank you. I love this. I love being able to also, um, oh, son, sorry, you guys. <laughs> You have like a very like, like sacred halo. Halo over you. <laughs> That's what it looked like. I thought either look really old or... Or yeah, just weird. Um, any other questions for Christine or comments? Okay, like I said, feel free to send them to me afterwards, Brenda at sachospice.org, and I'll forward them on to Christine and we'll get answers and resources for you. So Christine, thank you for your time. This has been great. Um, as I told you ahead of time, this is a subject that's really close to my heart and um, I appreciate everything you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the space. It was really lovely talking with you all.
Oh, uh, there were great questions. Good. Well, we've been talking for a while and listening for a while to words, which are really important, but there's also another way of communicating and um, that's just as important. So our next presenter will be sharing a little bit more about the power of music in our life as well. I would like to introduce to you Jean Ann Wolf. She is a certified music practitioner, CMP, who brings therapeutic music, hold on my thing there, therapeutic music, I just lost my place, oh, to Sutter Roseville Medical Center, and since 2010, coordinates the Music at the Bedside grant for the hospital. She recently retired as a San Juan District public school teacher to expand her playing for hospice, assisted living and memory care patients. Jean Ann is a cancer survivor thriver and is convinced of the value of live music to address pain, illness, and bring wellness within. Welcome, Jean Ann. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be here. And Thanks for letting me sit in on Christine's sharing. This is good for me to hear uh, as I journey, <laughs> journey ahead. Um, well, yes, uh, I brought my, along my instrument um, and we'll, I have a little bit of a presentation first and then we'll spend uh, the last uh, moments. Uh -oh. <laughs> I got a telephone call right then. Um, we'll spend a few minutes listening uh, to the harp and then sharing some questions just at the end. Um, yes, I do play at Sutter Roseville, of course, right now. Um, it's just in the lobby and I work underneath the chaplain's office there and they've said they're bringing me in in order to, I'm essential because I'm playing for staff and the stress that they're under there. So it's very sweet to be able to play just even in the lobby at the hospital right now. Um, well, Brenda, if you can pull up that uh, screen share of my slides, we can get started on that. Okay, hold for a moment. All right, I'm working on it. I'm having a slight little. Oh, well, let me just share just a little bit more. I've actually um, done quite a bit of playing for hospice patients, and it's one of my favorite uh, sh music shares because they're often uh, a little more isolated and uh, their family is very excited to, to have something to bring to them. And that was a little bit how I got started on my journey with the harp. I didn't come to it till like my late later 40s. Uh, and I had friends that were getting ill and sick and I didn't know what I could do for them. And music seemed like something that was um, powerful and something I could do and bring. And um, I was playing the harp at the time, uh, and I found out about the program to get certified to play at the bedside of patients. Um, so uh, I work with a nonprofit called Music Partners in Healthcare, uh, MPIH, we call ourselves. And um, we have probably about 20, 25 people that go and play at hospitals, at hospice, at eschatons, at skilled nursing. Um, we cover a bunch of counties and uh, the work is very amazing. Our stories are, we love to get together and just share the stories. Why don't we go to slide two and we'll get started here. We partner with healthcare facilities. I mean, we're very specific in, in this use of music uh, in a bunch of counties, bringing individualized, kind of like your own private moment with music. And it's not just MPIH, doesn't just have harpists. We have, um, people who play guitar, people who play cello, people who play flute, and even some people who sing 
And um, we can talk about that at the end of our time today. If you're someone who plays an instrument and would be interested in getting the training, uh, why don't you move to slide three? Yes. Um, so we are part of creating a healing environment. And that's why our work with hospice, it really ties in well. Therapeutic music that's live meets physical, social, emotional, and spiritual needs of patients. It encourages the respect for human dignity, and it creates a calm, pleasant space. And often the people that I go and play for, and I know the other uh, musicians who've gone, when we move into like a hospice facility or a home, the whole family joins in that uh, sharing of music. And I, in um, getting into relationships with some of the hospice patients over time, um, I've even had some hospice patients invite some of their neighbors in to hear the music. And one of the um, family members said to me one time, she said, this is so wonderful for my mom to be able to have something to give to her friends and family right now. So thank you for playing for her. And that, I never thought of that part of it. Um, on slide four, we also, uh, just to talk about what therapeutic music is, um, we use rhythm and melody, harmony, tone, resonance, resonance to facilitate the comfort of a patient. Um, sometimes in the hospital settings, uh, I'm, we're trained to look at monitors and kind of go right in with a patient's heartbeat and match that heartbeat and then maybe work with the music to bring them to a more stable heartbeat or even in their breathing to breathe deeper and, and less shallow in their breathing using um, large chords and low chords and high and low chords that really work with a patient and their, their monitored numbers and help them come to a more stable place. Next. So what is the difference between a certified music practitioner and a music therapist? A music therapist most likely would not be working with hospice patients um, because their uh, focus and intention is on progress and curative measures for patients uh, using the same things that a music practitioner uses in music, rhythm, tone, resonance, but they're working toward making progress goals a music practitioner is a specially trained musician using live acoustic music at bedside for therapeutic purposes. Um, I think of it as um, there are physical therapists and they're working toward, you know, better um, use of your body. A music practitioner is much more like a massage therapist in the moment, uh, using music to bring people to a, a, a calm place. We only use live music and the goal is to work with the patient's immediate needs for that healing environment. The certification takes about a year, sometimes two years, to complete uh, the particular uh, one that I went through is called Music for Healing and Transition, MHTP. Um, and, but there are several programs that have requirements that, that meet this um, profession. And um, that's why in hospitals and with hospice and skilled nursing and memory care, 
um, we're, we're using music very uh, specifically for what the patient uh, needs are. Go to the next slide. Therapeutic music addresses the needs of the whole person physiologically. And like I was saying before, working with breathing, working with sometimes their pain management, nausea, vomiting, discomfort, uh, working uh, with their monitors to see. You don't have monitors so much in the hospice home, um, but sometimes you do. Uh, in hospice, we're working with the physiological needs of a patient, kind of understanding uh, some of their uh, their concerns physiologically, but more than that, going to the next side, we're looking at their emotional side, we're using music. Um, sometimes uh, there's critical songs and sounds that are helpful. Um, just on a harp, uh, if you're playing in the top keys, um, and playing more hopeful. Um, it just kind of moves patients to um, almost a distraction of sound that brings them to a happier state, or at least a, a less depressed or less sad. I, I don't want to overstate what happens, but often they move to positive feelings. Or they the music triggers their memories and that brings up the emotions, the remembrance of good memories. Um, sometimes uh, the emotions of the caregivers uh, are able to be expressed when you're there playing for patients. Um, I found that to be true quite often in the hospital setting and in the home setting. Um, move to the next slide. The next one is the social piece. Uh, the isolation and the loneliness um, are overcome by just having a connection, something for people to look forward to. Um, mental confusion relief, uh, present, present awareness and alertness. Sometimes hospice patients that have some memory issues, uh, the music triggers their memories and they're right there with you, often singing along. I know a hospice patient that I've been recently playing for, a 94-year-old woman. She was a choir director and uh, when I start playing some of the folk songs, she starts directing and singing along and it's just very heartwarming. And it's like, she's right there with me, even though she's got some confusion, uh, the music is triggered and she's very present in that moment. Um, let's go to the next slide, Benda. The spiritual needs of patients are often addressed with music. Music triggers those memories um, and it relieves their fears. It, it creates a peaceful, supportive atmosphere for spiritual work. And often I've played as people transition from life into next. And uh, that's a very different form of playing and it facilitates the letting go. Uh, and that's like a whole interesting conversation uh, as I'm playing at the hospital and going in and playing for vigil, vigils with people. Also, a lot of people have a lot of memories of their spiritual life through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, and they, they love hearing those, and often that brings a comfort to them. Can you go to slide 10? The power of beauty. 
take a music bath and you will find it is the soul. It is to the soul what the water bath is to the body. Yes, it is. Next. And this is our contact information. If you want to reach out as a hospice group and um, ask some questions of us uh, and seek some of a partnership with us, or if you're interested um, to find out more about the work, you might play an instrument and you're interested in some of the process of certification. All right. Thank you for listening to that. Um, I want to tell a story. Uh, I think stories are kind of powerful to this work. And um, patient stories are kind of what keep me doing the work because um, when the patient is, uh, I, I, I love the hospice work because I can sit with patients and get to know them over time and, and know the family. And um, a particular patient I had a while back, uh, she had gotten the news at the hospital that she, that she was moving to palliative care. And um, everyone in her family was like shook and shaken. And um, she appeared to be quite at peace with her journey and next um, and felt like she was uh, being tasked now to take care of everybody else and, and their response to what was going on. And I didn't know any of this. I just came in the room and started to play for her. Uh, none of her family was there at the time and I just started to play and she started to weep. And um, the directive that I usually I'll play to, to a, a common ending and kind of stop and say, if it's too much, let me know. And she said, oh no, keep playing. So I kept playing and she just wept and everything. And she said, everyone is coming in so frantic, so worried for me, so wondering how it's going to be. And you're just bringing in the most beautiful sound and the most beautiful beauty. And, and you're here for me. Thank you. Thank you. It's better than all these flowers and words that everybody that is are bringing to me right now. I don't need the flowers. I don't want the words. This music is so beautiful. And I, and I started crying because I don't often think in those terms. So thank you. Um, let me uh, let me play for you. Um, first, I'd like to ask you to sit, kind of, um, just put yourself in a in a very comfortable position and close your eyes if you'd like, and um, we'll see uh, how this sound hits you, and maybe um, just kind of chat in on what what is happening with your body and I'll play for maybe three or four minutes. All right.
different ways of playing. That's um, often I play for people um, and I don't always play the recognizable songs, but uh, sometimes I will. Sometimes I'll ask if they have a song that they would like to uh, hear. And if I know it, I'll kind of, I call it, I'll try to noodle it for you and I try to noodle in on one of the songs. Um, and a lot of times with older patients, uh, uh, I'll do, um, oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom bees a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. And you know, singing, a, a, a patient singing brings a life and an aliveness and a presence to the moment that is captured with, with using music, with using music. So, um, yeah, yeah. And like I was mentioning, the patient that I had for quite a while, they started inviting some of their neighbors over for a little harp concert. <laughs> and uh, it was a beautiful time with the patient and the family. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, I wa also wanted to just play, since we have just a few moments here, I wanted to play with you, play for you a little bit of how we're trained to play ambient um, music that um, we play in vigil. Because in hospice, we were talking about end of life moments. And um, at, at Sutter Roseville, if a patient is actively dying, and I happen to be there that day, they'll say, could you go to this room and play for them? Um, the family would love that. And um, the playing is very different because you're helping the, the patient um, let go. So you're not playing, the songs are not as recognizable, even though the family will, you'll come in and they'll say, could you play Danny Boy, you know, and I might play that a little, but then I'm, I'm really focused on the, on the patient in the bed. But let me just um, play just a moment of what that sound might sound like. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's just more open, the sound decays, the patient can attune to it and yet they can, they don't know where it's going. It's, it's a little more unpredictable. So, well, thank you for letting me share my passion. Um, I've been working with MPIH and playing at bedside now for about 10 years. And it's interesting in the pandemic, I thought I was gonna retire and be doing this work. I feel like right now I'm playing for my own health, mm -hmm. well-being. Uh, <laughs> um, we use the words cradle of sound and just kind of rocking myself in this, this cradle that I play, um, learning new songs, using the time to just um, help my own well-being because if I'm not okay, I sure can't help anybody else. So. Anyway, if you have questions, um, there was at the end uh, of the slide presentation, there are some connections uh, to that. Um, but Brenda also has my contact information if you want to um, just reach out to me individually. So I'll send that out. Thank you, Jean Ann. Um, also, real quick, Jan had asked, and I think you answered it, but is your music spontaneous or scripted? And I think you kind of addressed that, didn't you? Um, well, the music, uh, sometimes uh, some of the um, members use music in the moment. I, ha I, I don't carry around music with me right now. Um, I hope I, I can always keep it up here at this point. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> but, um, but I started with a, with music and I've been able to move off of that. I have a piano uh, music background. So piano was my entrance to move to harp. So uh, yeah, but the script is uh, really the patient. The patient mm -hmm. is when you when you walk in the room and you're meeting the patient, you're you're kind of learning how to be aware of everything that's going on in the room. Um, I'm not always talking particularly too much. I'm just bringing sound mm -hmm. right away, and and watching for um, first of all a physiological response um, to the to what the patient is feeling in that moment, so. Oh, great. Well, I think, let me see, I have a couple more here I wanted to. So Ellie said, thank you, Jean Ann, as a CMP since 2003 via MHTP, I agree how comforting music is for patients, staff, family, and friends. Um, it travels as universal language for healing connection. So mm -hmm. thank you, Ellie. And, I wanted to share when you were speaking about um, the power of music, there's a YouTube video I recently watched about a prima ballerina who is now probably, have you seen that? At Swan Lake. Oh, she's dancing to Swan Lake. She has Alzheimer's and they start playing Swan Lake and from her wheelchair, she starts reenacting it almost perfectly. The most ballerina hands, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when I send out my thank you, I will send out a link to that video because it's just, it's beautiful. It really is. And it it speaks to the power of music. Mm -hmm. And I know with my dad, when he had Alzheimer's and we play music, there, there was a great connection. Yeah. Cowboy music, country music. Then he's oh. tapping and he was like my dad, right? Yeah. And also, I wanted to point out um, Sandy Wilson, who's on this call too. She's part of the Threshold Choir. And that's another beautiful, beautiful that's program. Good. Yes, yes. The people who play and sing at Vigil, mm -hmm. it's the most sacred ground. And um, yeah, you know, yeah. To be invited in at that moment with people is like incredible. It is, it's an honor. Incredible. Yes. Yeah, my heart is there. God didn't give me the voice. That's not where my gift lies. So, <laughs> but I certainly thank you so much for today. Um, I know I even feel better. I feel a little more peaceful, um, less stressed. And I'm going to now write this into my wishes that, um, that I have somebody play and sing to me at the end because I can just picture it. 
I can just picture it. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody else for being on here, whether you were able to join us live today or I'll be sending out the link. Um, and that'll probably go out in the next couple of days. It usually takes me a couple of days to get this ready. And so next week is the last of our four part, part series. And our final presentation is They're Gone, Now What? Our speaker is Heidi Boucher, and she will be talking about home funerals and um, different options like that that I think will be really good for us to hear about. So as Jean Ann said, I'll make sure you have her contact information as well um, if you want to reach out. And I think, I think we're good. I thank you. I thank Christine um, for a lovely morning. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys next week.